それではお時間となりましたのでこれより論文発表3特許取引を行います議長はソウル大学はい。That means we are proceeding from in the morning like uh, impact or patent system on economic performance and outcomes. Then we move to like uh, uh, how to creating IP or how to use knowledge. So many issues on IP itself. Then finally we are getting to the how to utilize IP and with more focus on the uh, licensing. So that's the idea of our this session. So we'll be uh, having four papers. Mostly on uh, licensing from various issues, also、um, validation of IP. So、um, uh, I'll introduce speakers, only first speaker, then、uh, I'll introduce later on as their t e r m s c o m e s、okay? So our first speaker is uh, uh, Yong, uh, Shim Cha Yong from University College London.、Okay? He is an assistant professor at Bean School there. Before that, he studied at uh, uh, Florence, Italy, at European University Institute. Then,、uh, after he joined the、uh, UCL, he created a team on uh,、um, innovation studies. So, I guess he is a、uh, rising uh, active uh, researcher in this field. So, let's invite him,、uh, Shim Cha Jong, to give a talk about 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks for the introduction. Good afternoon. Um, also, um, I would like to start to thank the OECD and the Japan Patent Office to invite me at this very interesting、um, conference. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to share、uh, my research、um, public research, technology licensing, and IP commercialization, mapping interdependencies in the cell therapy field, which I、um, Worked on together with、uh, Shini Wang of National Taiwan University, who is here today as well. So, we started doing this research um, because um, governments, science policymakers,、um, by controlling the lever of、um, science funding for science,、uh, has a significant、um, a role in、uh, shaping markets for IP and IP commercialization. And,、um, We feel that there are some opportunities to、uh, shed a light, light on the role government plays in this area, in particular、uh, where it pertains to the role、um, science policymakers play in、uh, shaping IP markets in、um, industries、uh, where entrepreneurial firms in、uh, high tech industries play, play an important role. So,、um, government, government,、uh, policymakers and government play an important role in.、Um, Funding、uh, early stage RD in, in, in high tech industries.、Um, just to illustrate this,、um, contrasting some public and private funding for、um, biotech co companies in the Silicon Valley area. The、uh, Silicon Valley,、um, which is the largest high tech cluster in the US, venture capitalists in this region invested in 2012、um, for $104 million in seed and startup funding. For biotech firms. In this same period, the US、uh, federal government, through the National Institutes of Health, invested、um, 
million dollar in uh, early stage um, biomedical research at the major research universities in the San Francisco Bay Area, and um, invested uh, for 41 million dollars through the small business um, innovation research grant scheme um, directly in uh, small businesses to commercialize mostly biotechnology innovations um, in this field. So how does this um, funding for uh, early stage science and um, funding through the SBIR scheme uh, reach um, translates into um, commercial projects? So there are two mechanisms really, Oops. which we identified. Um, Can you make it bigger? Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, new companies are being formed around um, university IP. So some of the largest um, new firms created in the US over the past years were uh, companies formed around uh, IP developed within universities. And also in Japan, um, we increasingly see a large number of um, startup firms emerge around the major research universities. In addition, um, increasingly uh, uh, larger, more established firms, they rely on collaborations, um, open innovation models to organize their innovation, and increasingly also rely on collaborations with uh, academic laboratories. As a result, the innovation ecosystem that's uh, sort of uh, shaped by science funding, it encompasses both uh, small entrepreneurial startup firms and more established firms. So um, what we uh, try to do in our research, we focus on two uh, uh, relationships. First of all, we examine how um, public funding for science affects um, IP commercialization activity. And we um, sort of um, propose that there is a positive relationship so that uh, public funding for science has a positive impact on uh, IP commercialization in a specific field. Um, universities have emerged as critical, critical suppliers in IP markets, in particular in areas such as biotechnology, where um, IP owned by universities comprises about 20% of the total amount of patents in these areas. Um, also, commercial R&D projects in high-tech industries uh, find their origin in academic research. Um, some research based on uh, 1990 survey data highlighted that around 40% of uh, new pharmaceutical products find their origin in academic laboratories. And also we expect that uh, companies there are um, more likely to invest in areas where there is a greater funding commitment because uh, as companies commercialize IP projects, uh, they uh, encounter new problems and um, often they rely on academic uh, laboratories for input in solving these problems. Second, uh, we posit a positive relationship between public funding for science and the success of IP commercialization projects. Um, input from academic laboratories is critical to R&D success in R&D in science intensive industries. And also companies, they rely on um, companies that do start IP commercialization projects in specific areas, they rely on all kinds of collaborators. So uh, in the biotech industry, they rely on downstream um, product development partners such as pharmaceutical firms. They rely on investors, venture capitalists willing to invest in their projects, contract manufacturers. They rely on scientists willing to commit their careers to specific fields. And uh, we posit that it's uh, far more, less likely that com um, companies are willing to com commit resources to a specific area where uh, science funding is weak. Um, we examine these relationships in the context of the cell therapy sector. It's a new cell, um, sector within the biotech industry organized around um, new technologies that, around which companies they develop um, therapies that are based on cells as opposed to small molecule drugs, protein drugs, which are more traditional uh, pharmaceutical um, products. Um, the cell therapy sector, new products, they're mostly science-driven, so they're based on 
uh, academic discoveries at leading universities in this area. Also here in Japan, the Kyoto University um, has supplied a lot of new IP in this area, and there are a lot of product um, being developed based on these technologies. And stem cell research, policymakers have eyed this area as a, um, as a, a sector showing growth, great promise. And as part of the 2013 economic stimulus, for example, here in Japan, the science ministry earmarked two, 21 um, billion uh, yen to, to um, invest in research on stem, cell, on stem cells with an eye on, um, on, on supporting um, downstream product commercialization. In terms of examining the effect of science funding on IP commercialization, we uh, focus on one uh, very specific episode. So we focus on a, um, a change in the funding environment uh, in the US and during the period 2001-2009, which we see as a sort of exo exogenous shock, which affected the funding environment for this kind of research in the US. So in 2001, in a national televised address, the US um, President George Bush at the time um, announced that he would uh, impose a uh, funding moratorium on specific types of human embryonic stem cell research. Um, this was a very controversial move, and several years later, um, um, there was a, a lot of political opposition, and individual states, they started to um, develop initiatives to um, sort of fill up this funding gap. And in, whoop, And the most notable of these initiatives was, was the um, 2004 uh, Proposition 78, 71, in which California voters, they um, voted in favor of um, issuing state bonds to, fill, to fund um, $1 billion of research in a stem cell uh, research field. Um, as I mentioned, it was a very controversial um, law and Congress enacted a law in 2006 to uh, lift the um, moratorium, funding moratorium on these types of human embryonic stem cell research. However, um, the president vetoed this bill and only in 2009 was the federal funding moratorium uh, lifted. Um, so we think this uh, specific episode offers a, a promising uh, set, set natural experiment setting to examine the ex, uh, impact of um, science funding, changes in science funding on uh, IP commercialization. Um, so basically what we're able to do is compare um, the um, IP commercialization um, during the period of the funding moratorium to the um, situation before and after the funding moratorium. And also we're able to look at what happened during the funding moratorium in the US in terms of IP commercialization and compare that what's happened in uh, other countries around the world and also look at the relationship um, before and after the, the moratorium was in place. Um, there have been a number of existing studies that have looked at the impact of the human uh, embryonic stem cell mor research mor funding mon moratorium in the US, uh, which has found a significant um, short, a prompt and um, short uh, drop in the, uh, actually the scientific output in this specific area uh, among US scientists. And also uh, this um, research has highlighted that uh, scientists, they tended to move away from our, uh, regions, uh, both in the US and specific um, regions within the US, um, away from uh, um, regions where the funding uh, situation was um, weak. Um, so to study the impact of the um, changes in the scientific funding environment in the stem cell research field on IP commercialization, we collected data on uh, 864 um, technology uh, transfer deals of, um, between academic institutions and industry um, over the period 1986-2010. Um, we collected uh, data on 633 uh, cell therapy commercialization projects um, initiated by firms over the period 1986 and 2011 and um, 
maps uh, key development uh, milestones for these projects, um, including um, uh, project failure or project success. Um, we collected data on the firms initiating these um, development projects and uh, we found, uh, so we created uh, two sample, samples of US, um, including samples of both US and non-US projects and these samples were roughly uh, similar in terms of the, uh, um, the types of projects that were under development. So analyzing this data, we uh, first of all um, examined a first proposition. Um, we looked at the impact of the uh, scientific funding cut on uh, the amount of IP commercialization in this area. And we also proposed that this was an impact that was localized, building on extensive um, literature that argues that um, technology transfer is really a localized process. And so we expect uh, the, the impact on IP commercialization to be localized to the uh, region where these funding cuts, they're, they're, they're put in place. So what we found looking at, um, so what does our data show? First of all, uh, analyzing the um, data on technology licensing, we found that during the period immediately after the enactment of the funding moratorium, we see a drop in the proportion of uh, technology licensing deals that um, involve universities and um, this is consistent with previous work that has focused on um, the impact on uh, the funding cut on uh, scientific work which highlighted that a, um, the, the scientific output was especially affected during the um, immediate years after the enactment of the funding moratorium and um, before the individual states started to uh, fund additional, provide additional funding for stem cell research uh, to make up the federal um, funding cuts. Looking at the uh, number of uh, new projects that uh, enter uh, clinical trials in the stem cell research field, um, looking at non-US versus US companies, we see a um, immediate and uh, significant drop in new uh, IP commercialization projects in this area in the US uh, immediately after the enactment of the funding moratorium. And we see that uh, IP commercialization projects, they start to pick up again um, after um, California voters, they, um, they pass Proposition uh, 71, which uh, provides, tries to make up some of the funding gaps in this, in this area. So looking at the impact of um, changes in the funding environment for scientific research on the success of IP commercialization projects. So again, we um, examine, um, first of all, um, the impact of uh, funding cuts on the success of uh, IP commercialization projects that are underway. And um, we expect that this is a localized uh, effect that mainly affects um, projects in, uh, launched in, 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 in the US where this funding moratorium was in place. So in order to test this proposition, we conducted a number of logit uh, re re regressions using as the dependent variety, uh, variable um, project failure, which we defined as a company deciding to um, terminate a IP commercialization project in a, a cell therapy field um, and not finding a, another company willing to take up that project as a, down, as a licensing partner. So what we find looking at the entire, at the global uh, cell therapy uh, field, uh, we do not find a, um, a significant impact um, during the period immediately following the enactment of the um, funding moratorium, uh, looking at the entire um, um, global uh, cell therapy industry. However, if we divide up the sample in a US and a non-US sample, we um, do find um, for a US uh, project, a significant um, increase in failure rates um, during the period immediately following the uh, funding moratorium, uh, where model two, um, model three uh, and four include various controls, and uh, model four includes uh, controls for fixed effects as well. And again, here, uh, looking at the entire um, sample, 
using um, different periods and the uh, the place the the location of the companies that launch the um, the IP commercialization projects. Um, we find that uh, sort of if we use the period immediately after the uh, enactment of the funding moratorium and the U.S. location of companies, we see that uh, for U.S.-based companies during this um, period, fund uh, failure rates, they, they, um, they were, were higher. And we try to visualize this in the, in the following draft. We see that over the entire pe period that uh, f predicted uh, failure rates, they were roughly similar, except for the brief period following the enactment of the um, funding moratorium in the US uh, on specific types of human embryonic stem cell research. So in conclusion, we um, find that um, policymakers, uh, governments, they uh, hold a powerful lever, lever in terms of their control over scientific funding, in terms of affecting the uh, amount of IP commercialization uh, going on in a specific area, and also in terms of creating an environment um, that's uh, supportive of the success of uh, individual projects. Um, we also highlight how um, decisions about um, scientific funding policies, they have spillover effects, uh, which were unexpected um, in, in, the, in the specific case of the, the, um, the funding moratorium on specific types of human embryonic stem cell research. And we also highlight opportunities um, uh, governments have in terms of using their uh, the science funding lever in terms of uh, encouraging new IP commercialization uh, activities in specific areas. Um, so th these were our main uh, concluding remarks and um, I'm looking forward to your uh, comments later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jung. So he found impact of uh, public funding, especially moratorium on the uh, licensing. Then we move to impact on um, licensing of the patent ticket. Okay. So in the case of a Japanese company, uh, presentation will be done by uh, done by Prof. Zhang Zhang Xingyuan from uh, Okayama uh, University. He has a course uh, uh, Noriki Doi from uh, Kansai Gakuin University. Okay. <laughs> So Prof. Zhang is a professor of uh, applied microeconomics at uh, Okami University. His research area is on the productivity, innovation, and technology, especially uh, speed of work. Okay. He has a uh, main article in these uh, topics. So Prof. Zhang, okay. floor is. Uh, many thanks for the organizers and the scientific community of uh, the conference giving us uh, uh, such a great opportunity to present our paper. <coughs> This is my first time to present our paper in such a big hall. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, uh, the motivation for this paper is very simple because this topic is very hard, you know, <laughs> it's very challenging. Uh, the second, uh, we want to uh, give uh, some uh, uh, Japanese evidence in such field. So, <clears throat> okay, next is our outlines after uh, giving a brief, uh, a short uh, literature survey. So I like to describe our data source, uh, which include uh, licensed data source and the patent data source. So next, uh, I uh, like to propose uh, uh, two alternative methods to measure patent secrets. Uh, then uh, give uh, empirical results and uh, finding uh, and discussion. <laughs> okay, uh, for the uh, literature survey, I like to pick up uh, several papers uh, here. Uh, you know, uh, there are large big board, uh, large uh, big board, uh, there are large body of uh, literature focusing on uh, patent circuits, patent license, and the relationship uh, between circuits and uh, <coughs> patent license. Uh, there's uh, uh, many papers that uh, discuss uh, how to uh, measure patent circuits like uh, Zidonis or uh, Klassen or Gravenitz, et cetera. Uh, 
uh, for empirical studies on the patent circuits and uh, license, uh, here I'd like to uh, give uh, uh, two papers here. Uh, one is uh, Nishimura Nagaoka, uh, 2012. Uh, in that paper, they use uh, a fragmentation of patent stock ownership in second uh, from a survey, uh, from a survey data. So their findings show that uh, patent circuits uh, have uh, no significant impact on patent use. And next paper is uh, Schubert and uh, Gravinitz. Uh, they propose uh, theoretic models uh, to show the relationship between uh, exon art and exposed uh, license on uh, hold up. So uh, their findings uh, show that exposed Exposed license, uh, license uh, if uh, expected broking is low, but realized uh, broking uh, is high. Okay, uh, so these uh, literatures uh, raise uh, some research problem. Uh, one is uh, there's uh, a variety of uh, methods to measure the patent circuit. The second is uh, the findings of relationship between patent circuits and license are very mixed. So next is our, uh, the purpose of the paper. Here we, uh, we want to use the information released in annual security reports of a Japanese listed company uh, to gather data for licensing, licensing countries. The second, we want to uh, propose uh, alternative methods uh, to measure patent circuits. Lastly, uh, we use this uh, method uh, to examine the effects of patent circuits on licensing and the patent portfolio races in, for Japanese uh, listed companies. Okay, this is our data. Uh, as you know, uh, Japanese listed companies uh, release uh, the information uh, for the business to uh, stockholders every year. Uh, here, I'd like to give you an example for uh, one section of uh, this uh, security, uh, annual security reports. Uh, this, this page is called as uh, uh, important technology contracts in business. If, uh, if say in Japanese, we say it is a business, jiyo no keyaku, keijo jiyo no keyaku. Okay, uh, this information uh, covers name of uh, license and license, uh, license. Uh, also include uh, license and countries and the contents of uh, countries and the start year of the countries. Uh, in the most cases, uh, we can identify every uh, license and licenses, uh, but in some cases, like this one, uh, like this one. <coughs> So uh, there, are, so we can we cannot uh, identify uh, each each license. Uh, fortunately, this case is not so often happen. Okay, uh, this is a distribution of uh, licensing countries across industry. Uh, this table shows that uh, the majority of uh, licenses and the licenses uh, are concentrated in the chemi chemicals and the uh, pharmaceutical uh, machinery and the electric and the electronic machinery uh, sectors. <coughs> and next is our uh, patent data source. We use uh, patent uh, citations uh, from JIIP and use the information for full IPC from uh, statistics. Okay, uh, next we consider how to uh, build an index for uh, sick, uh, patent circuits. Uh, here I'd like to uh, give you uh, three index on this uh, measurement. One is uh, 
is the index uh, proposed by Schiebert and Granvinitz, uh, 2008. Uh, there are two terms uh, in this index. Uh, the second is uh, a technical proximity. Approximate. The first is uh, ratio of uh, citations. So <laughs> we pay attention on this uh, uh, term uh, and propose uh, uh, two alternative methods beside this uh, index. The first uh, alternative method is uh, adjusted Clarsen, uh, proposed by Clarsen 2005. <laughs> okay, uh, basically uh, this index uh, is a, a ratio of uh, a citation, number of citations uh, to uh, totally possible citations uh, within the same field, same, same market or same technology field. So this index, if, uh, index reflects the cumulative nature of innovation within the same market and reveals the extent to which a hold of occurs in the same technology field. Our next uh, uh, index is employee uh, method uh, Sorry. It's employing the method proposed by Zhang 2013. Uh, before I give you uh, uh, the index, the uh, uh, index of the measurement, I'd like to give you an image for uh, for our ideas. So uh, here is the front page of a patent, a JPO patent for a patent. Uh, appli uh, applied for by uh, Hitachi in, in uh, 1995. So uh, for the most uh, patents, uh, Japanese patent offices assign uh, more than two IPC classifications for one patent. So the basic idea is that uh, how many uh, IPC classifications uh, between citing and the cited uh, patent are same. So we, we, so we use uh, this uh, equation to measure the, this uh, overlap, this overlap uh, in the technical uh, characteristics. Okay, so uh, I, uh, let me skip up other variables then give you uh, descriptive of statics uh, for our <coughs> regulations. Uh, look at uh, the three types of uh, index. Uh, you can find that the value, uh, the value uh, are larger for the uh, firm pairs th uh, that choose uh, license uh, than that, uh, that uh, than the firm pairs that uh, didn't license at all. <coughs> Okay, uh, next is our uh, uh, OAS estimates uh, for the uh, relationship between uh, licensing and uh, blocking and blocking and the patent circuits. Uh, look at the uh, up panel of the table. Uh, you can find the coefficients of uh, a blocking uh, SG uh, and the blocking of uh, Clarsen and the blocking of uh, the tongue are all strongly positive, significant. Uh, that means uh, uh, the blocking of uh, the blocking uh, uh, is uh, positively associated uh, the uh, patent license uh, in the case. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, so next, look at please look at. Uh, low panel of the table. Uh, here, I, we, uh, we provide uh, several uh, AIC and uh, BIC uh, information cri uh, criteria uh, for the different, for the 
a specification of the models. So you can find that uh, the AIC and uh, BIC uh, are smaller for the specification of model with uh, a broken zone uh, than those for the broken of SG and the broken of uh, uh, class. Uh, this is uh, uh, estimate results from uh, logic uh, estimates uh, as a counterpart for uh, to the uh, results we get uh, we got from OS. Uh, the results are quite uh, coincident with each other. Okay. Uh, in order to investigate the relationship between. Uh, uh, broken or patent circuit and uh, license and the uh, relationship between license and the patent portfolio race, uh, we use, uh, we use uh, endogenous treatment uh, regulations here. <laughs> so look at the upper uh, panel, you can find that uh, the coefficient of uh, license are all negative. Uh, negative, and uh, coefficients for three types of uh, blocking are positive. Okay, uh, next is our main uh, findings. Uh, patent blocking faced both by license or license uh, licensee has uh, significant effects on the firms of uh, license activities. Uh, second is uh, that as the uh, index of uh, patent blocking a uh, blocking of sound shows a uh, more appropriate in the sense of statics than the block, blocking of SG and the blocking of uh, uh, class. The former uh, may identify a degree of IP overlap between citing and the cited patents. Our second finding show that licensee help to reduce the patent portfolio risk measured by patent application uh, made both by uh, licenses and license, while patent blocking raises uh, propensity for patent applications both in license and license forms. Okay, uh, next is our discussion. <coughs> our findings on relation between patent circuit and license uh, activity active uh, gives partially support to those in Schubert and uh, Gravinism uh, 2008, but different with those uh, of Nishimura and uh, Nagaoka uh, 2012. Uh, this, uh, this results may suggest that uh, it is a need to carefully uh, examine the best uh, methods in which uh, economics has uh, sought, uh, have sought to uh, quantify uh, quantified extent of uh, patent circuits. The next is related to our data source. <laughs> An important technology contracts in business uh, of uh, annual security reports uh, is a variable data source and uh, uh, the key point is uh, it's uh, open to access for uh, empirical analysis uh, in Japan. So uh, our resource can be uh, replicated. However, some countries may not be listed uh, due to the case that the company do not think the countries are important and they uh, did not disclose it uh, to stockholders. Okay, uh, lastly, the method used in the paper for uh, measure patent circuits uh, here are all based on the citations. Uh, however, the citations does not uh, necessarily indicate the owner of uh, cited patents is in a position to limit the use of uh, uh, citing patent. Uh, so how to quantify the extent of patent circuits uh, is still a big challenge. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So here's uh, some different results from that by uh, Professor Nagaoka. So we'll discuss that after that. Okay.
Then let's move on to the third paper, which is about uh, impact of technical distance on MNA. MNA is another form of uh, IP transactions. Okay, so the presentation will be done by Florian Stellner from uh, Germany, yeah. Max Planck Institute. Before joining uh, Max Planck as a doctor student, he studied at uh, Oxford okay. and also at uh, London School of Economics and Political Science. Well, then we can start. Right. Yes. Well, um, I would like to thank the organizers as well uh, for inviting me and having the opportunity to uh, present my research on the impact of technological distance on M&A target choice and transaction value. Um, so my focus is pretty much on the market uh, for firms, but I focus specifically on um, technological aspects in that field. Um, so there is still an angle which uh, makes me fit in this um, this section here. Um, so the agenda is nothing unusual, so I'll start directly with the, the introduction. Um, so my uh, the results that I present today, um, they're pretty much based on the build on a project um, I did uh, previously where I investigated various distance measures. Um, so I'd like firstly to talk uh, a few words about um, the concept of technological distance. Um, so what is technological distance? The, what I'm interested in in this uh, project here is the distance between firms um, and conceptually it refers to the overlap of knowledge base between firms uh, where knowledge base um, is defined as the method of search, uh, sources of knowledge and the area of application. So the more overlap there is between firms, the, the less distance they are in knowledge space. Um, there's also a formal uh, definition, which is the length of technological space uh, between two firms, and that's where patent data comes in. So um, the position in this space is uh, normally determined by uh, using patent data, in particular classifications of patents into um, IPCs or um, USPTO classifications, and you can do that at several levels, so class level, subclass level, and so on. Um, and so what I've done in my, my previous project is I um, assessed a few uh, distance measures, uh, 10 overall, based on 10 different criteria, building pretty much on, on the work done by Blum, Schankerman, and Van Rienen. Um, I use more distance measures which I assess in this project, um, and I use some different uh, criteria to assess them. I use measures which are quite uh, well known in the literature. The first one, um, or the most frequent one, is the angular separation introduced by Jeffy in 86 and 88, uh, and also a few others which are frequently used, a few new ones which have come up in the last four years, and also a few new ones which uh, we developed at the uh, Max Planck Institute. Um, so for the, for the purpose of this uh, research project, I use uh, two uh, distance measures. The first one is the angular separation, as it's the most widely used. Uh, and I also use the Jaffe covariance, which has been introduced by Blum, Schankerman, and Van Rienen in 2013, predominantly because it was given sound uh, microeconomic foundations, and it also has a few uh, nice statistical properties. Um, so it has no bias in small samples and also satisfies the independence of the relevant patent classes criterion. Um, I'm very happy to talk about this project to anybody who's interested after the presentation, but I now I'd like to start um, delving deeper into the motivation for uh, the project, uh, which is the impact of technological distance on M&A target choice and transaction value. So there are two main strands in the research, how M&A um, and technological distance are related. The first one, which has received most attention, is the impact of uh, an M&A transaction as a function of the technological distance between the target and the acquirer. And there, um, most studies, or pretty much all studies, found that an intermediate level of technological distance between the target and the acquirer is most conducive to innovation as measured by patenting output after the transaction. And the theoretical um, arguments which have been given for, for uh, this finding is that on the one hand, um, proximity provides the, uh, the ground for absorptive capacity. So if, a company, if the target is close to the acquirer, uh, it has a better ability to assess and evaluate um, the target. On the other hand, a certain degree of distance also has a positive impact and that it allows the acquirer to um, gain new insights to get a novelty gain. 
And there's also evidence from the alliance literature, which also finds that an intermediate level of distance is most conducive to uh, post-alliance innovation performance. On the other hand, uh, there is a research which investigates the choice made by the acquirer in terms of which target the acquirer uh, chooses. And there, um, studies have used binary choice models and estimated using a conditional logit. And these studies uh, pretty much all find that it's technologically close firms which are acquired. Um, some studies have looked for a curvilinear effect, so whether the, uh, the findings which we found from the post M&A performance also hold for the uh, choice uh, decision made by the acquirer, but uh, there is no support um, so far um, indicating that there is a curvilinear linear relationship that, in it, that acquirers choose companies with an intermediate level of technological distance. So this can uh, very succinctly be summarized as follows. So, on the left-hand side, you have uh, that the post M&A um, uh, performance is uh, best when technological distance is intermediate and uh, acquirers choose targets which are technologically close. Um, so this brings me to my uh, hypothesis, which I test in, in this project. Um, so the first hypothesis uh, which is that acquirers choose targets with an intermediate level of technological distance has two uh, foundations. The first one is theoretical and the other one has to do with the uh, motivation I just showed you. So from a theoretical perspective, um, uh, there is an advantage of proximity and there's also an advantage of distance. So proximity has the advantage, techno technological proximity has the advantage that it provides current absorptive capacity, so you're in a better position to value and assimilate the technology of the acquirer. Um, it also has strategic value and that if you acquire a company which is close to you, you might be able to build a patent fence or you might uh, be able to resolve a patent dispute which uh, exists between technologically close firms and it may allow you to operate more freely in terms of uh, conducting your R&D activities. Um, it also has uh, economies of scale and avoiding duplication uh, benefits and might also cause less disruption uh, if the target and acquirer are close in terms of their technological mindset. Uh, but uh, distance also has some virtues. Um, so uh, if a company is more distant technologically, um, you can learn something new. Um, it also provides future absorptive capacity in that um, if you acquire a company which is more distant uh, to yourself, uh, you learn uh, something about a new um, uh, technology and you might be able to build on this technology going forward, acquire other companies in that uh, technological sphere uh, and provide you um, a sort of a better future absorptive capacity. It also reduces risk, allows you to diversify technologically and it might also be uh, a way to develop something which you can't do on your own because it takes a lot of time or it's very expensive to uh, engage in a new uh, type of technology. And uh, to balance sort of the, the uh, benefits and um, of proximity and distance, uh, an intermediate level of uh, distance might actually be most conducive to, to in a, in a, might actually be what uh, acquirers choose in terms of their targets. And I put a quote by Cohen Leventhal, and there's also a quote by Sapienza who argues that both too small and too great an overlap will inhibit growth. The first, because limited knowledge overlap hampers local search and knowledge assimilation. And the second, because great knowledge overlap hampers the creation of novel uh, knowledge uh, combinations. And in addition to this uh, theoretical perspective, there's also the uh, second argument, which uh, says that to be consistent with the post M&A innovation performance evident, which has just showed that there's a curvilinear relationship uh, in terms of the post M&A performance. So if the aim of an acquirer is to improve innovation after the M&A transaction, then uh, it should also opt for a company which has an, has an, in, in, sorry, which has an intermediate level of technological distance to itself. Uh, the second hypothesis um, is pretty much built on the same theoretical arguments, but uh, it looks at the transaction price. So the transaction price which the acquirer pays for the target um, is obviously a function of financials and assets, uh, but it's also a function of synergies which exist between the target and the acquirer. 
And synergies can arise uh, for one uh, on, on the technological side. Um, so here again, the argument is if synergies are highest, uh, if there is an intermediate level of technological distance, then acquirers should also choose companies which have an intermediate level of technological distance. So the arguments are the same as in hypothesis one, but it's a different uh, dependent variable here. Uh, the third uh, hypothesis looks at the uh, looks at a negative interaction effect between product market uh, distance and uh, technological distance. Um, so the argument here is uh, the hypothesis, hypothesis here is that the higher the product market distance between the acquirer and the target, the more will acquirers prefer firms which are close in technological space. Uh, so the argument here is that if a company is more distant to you in knowledge space or technological space, there is a high degree of uncertainty and asymmetric information. Um, so it's very difficult often for the acquirer to assess um, the technology that the, the target has uh, and that uh, it will be very difficult for an acquirer to venture uh, distant in both spheres. So acquiring a company which is distant in uh, technological space as well as in product market space. Uh, but if a company is close in uh, technology space, for example, the acquirer is in a position to venture further away in um, uh, product market space, and the same goes for uh, technological space. So if it's close in, um, sorry, if it's close in product market space, then it can venture further in technological space in terms of choosing the acquirer, uh, the target. So these are the uh, hypotheses, and I use uh, Hall's model of target choice uh, to assess um, the first and the third hypothesis. I won't go much into detail here, but uh, a few points to stress is that the decision is made uh, on the acquirer which target to um, acquire. So it's uh, purely from the perspective of the, uh, of the acquirer. Um, and each Acquirer essentially has uh, a choice set which is constituted by the actual target which was acquired um, in the data set. So you get a set of transactions you look up, and then uh, in the choice set, obviously, the, the target which was acquired is actually in the choice set, and you match a set of firms to this choice set which the target could have acquired but hasn't acquired, uh, which the acquirer um, could have acquired but hasn't acquired. And um, so this uh, is one point I would like to mention, that's the uh, model implementation in terms of the choice set. There are two approaches which I uh, conduct here. The first one is uh, a random sample of firms in the choice set. So essentially, if you have a transaction that uh, Rush Diagnostics bought Böhringer, um, you would match a set of 500 firms to the choice set of Roche, which it could have acquired, and it's a random sample of firms that just drawn randomly from all um, uh, potential firms it could have acquired. Um, but the problem here is that obviously many firms in this choice set will not be really um, targets that uh, Roche would have considered, so it wouldn't consider Deutsche Bank or Siemens or um, firms which are clearly not in, in, in a related sector. So what I do as, as a second approach is I put in the choice set only the firms which are in the same two-digit SIC code and which also have a size which is in a reasonable range uh, for the acquirer. So the target shouldn't be more than twice as big as the acquirer. In terms of the, the data, um, I have uh, 538 M&A transactions um, for, uh, covering a 20-year period up to 2005. Uh, and I cover both public firms and receive financed firms. The reason being that uh, when two public firms merge, often technology might not be the motivating factor, whereas for VC finance firms, these are often very innovative firms, very technology driven. And when such a company is acquired, often technology plays a, a big role. For example, for Cisco, they acquired, uh, obviously, very frequently acquire companies which um, have received VC financing, which are very innovative in their area. Um, and then I also have a subsample of firms which, uh, for which financials are available for 380 and I conduct the analysis for them as well and obviously I only look at firms which uh, um, do patent uh, so I can actually determine the technological distance. Then the variables included, uh, just very briefly, um, 
It's uh, two models. The first one is the choice model. It's an indicator function. And the second uh, model, it's estimated using ordinary least squares. And I use the natural logarithm of the transaction price as the dependent variable. Technological distance, I use two measures, as, as I previously said. It's the angular separation and the Jeffy covariance at the subcategory level. And product market distance is determined by the overlap of SIC codes. So these are the um, descriptives, very briefly. So 80% uh, of the transactions are in one of uh, five industries. Um, and it's mostly high technology industries. So 87% of the transactions are uh, made by acquirers which are in um, high technology sectors as determined by Hall and Wopel. Um, and also uh, the majority of these transactions are within the same two-digit two SIC code, so within sector um, transactions. And at the bottom, you see the four different samples I use, so uh, det dependent on whether I include private firms or not, and also whether I use a random matching in the choice set or um, a, a matched um, a set of uh, matched set of firms in the choice set, uh, depending on the SIC code and the size of the firm. Five minutes. Okay. Um, so the choice model, um, there are quite a few regressions, obviously. There's, there are four data sets and the two measures. And uh, essentially, I include a linear term and a square term in, in these models, as is usually done to assess for, um, to test for a nonlinear effect. And what I get here is that essentially the uh, linear term is positive and highly significant, and the uh, square term is negative and highly significant, and it's independent of which measure I use and um, also which, which um, data set I use. Um, so this would suggest that there is a nonlinear or inverse U-shaped relationship, but there is a problem in that um, if you draw the, the inverted U shape, uh, there is only very, very little mass in the declining part of the curve. Uh, so it's uh, only a, a small fraction of the, the, the data is actually in the declining part. So it's estimated very um, imprecisely, uh, at least at the declining part. So what I do next is I do two uh, robustness tests. First is a dummy variable approach. So I use uh, deciles um, for each of the uh, distance measures, and I exclude obviously one uh, dummy variable, which is the dummy variable where the peak occurs, uh, as determined by the um, nonlinear, uh, nonlinear, uh, the um, uh, linear and square term as a reference point. And what I would like to see if, uh, to get an inverted U shape is actually that the highest decile is negative and highly significant, so it's below the peak value. Um, but in both, in all specifications, I don't get this uh, finding. So. Uh, it's still increasing when I use the angular separation, so the likelihood still increases if it gets very close to you, the, the target. Um, for the Jeffy covariance, it decreases, but it decreases only slightly, and it's not significant, the likelihood that you get acquired. Um, I also use fractional polynomials to test whether another specification is better than a linear and square term, and they all indicate that uh, other specifications suit the data better, and they indicate a flattening curve. So there's no indication of inverted U shape. Also for the transaction value hypothesis two, uh, there is no uh, significant inverted U shape relationship. If you look at the data as well, uh, you can't really see a, a strong support for an inverted U shape relationship. An interaction effect, it's as expected. So uh, you do have a negative interaction effect between product market overlap and um, technological distance. So to conclude, um, what I find is there is no robust evidence for an inverted U-shaped relationship between technological distance and the likelihood of uh, being acquired. Uh, rather, the relationship appears to be uh, a flattening curve. So if a company is close to you and um, the likelihood increases if it gets by a bit, if it gets closer to you, but if it gets the further away it gets, uh, the likelihood decreases quite sharply. It also shows there is an importance for methodological rigor, so just testing for linear and square terms is not often uh, sufficient to, um, to, um, get your, um, uh, to get your findings. Um, so I still have to reconcile the puzzle between the post M&A performance and the target choice. So one option would be that uh, managers are risk averse. They just choose targets which are close to them, uh, close to them because it's easier. There's less risk for them to make a mistake. Um, and uh, therefore, 
uh, they don't act in the best interest of the company, uh, but act in their own interest. Uh, another option would be that um, uh, companies are interested in uh, economies of scale, so reducing output, uh, um, sorry, reducing uh, cost is their main criterion, and it's not increasing output after the transaction. And a third uh, possible reason is that uh, the post M&A evidence, which I discussed, has not been thoroughly tested. So they've only included linear and square terms, but if they use maybe fractional polynomials or other methodologies, the results might not uh, be what they are currently uh, showing to be. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So he get very uh, some nuanced result about impact of distance on M and A's. Okay. I guess the result might depend on how you classify sectors, you know, broadly or narrowly. Okay. So we'll discuss that. Then uh, we move, uh, we are doing too well in terms of timing. On the <laughs> everybody's uh, very on time. So I hope uh, last speaker will follow the same uh, <laughs> format. Okay. So last speaker is about uh, uh, topic is about the art of possible with the subtitle, uh, Increasing Value of Nascent Technology Using Strategic Disclosures. Our presenter is uh, Ilo Peters from uh, Ecole Polytechnic in, based in Lausanne. He is a chair of uh, Corporate Strategy and Innovation. Okay? So he is focuses on the impact to IP strategy on the innovation outcomes. Okay? So we have, we have the floor. Okay? okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for lasting through on this marathon session and also <laughs> it's been a fascinating time. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and appreciated the efforts that have gone into it. So today I'm here to talk to you about the art of the possible. Now let me explain this term a little bit. This came to me from the discussion I had with the CEO of a, uh, of a company developing very advanced solar uh, photovoltaic technologies. And he talked about the, the task he faced in classifying what was the nature of their knowledge. And so he spoke about, of course, having to find out the prior art that they were dealing with and make sure that that was covered as prior art. And then there, was, there also was the uh, existence of patents, the, the, the state of the art as far as the company was concerned, and the even more important factors that they kept as trade secrets. However, the thing that he found to be most challenging to deal with was what he called the art of the possible. This is technology that is so far advanced that he knew there wouldn't be either the market for it or the commercial capacity to produce it for seven to ten years. And he said, well, what do we do with that? Do we invest in uh, the, the time and the cost of, of patenting it, or do we instead find out some other way to generate uh, discourse on this? And he said, my scientists are, are so far ahead of the rest of the crowd that even if other people pick it up and research it, they should, you know, my scientists can then profit off of that as well. So this started me to thinking, you know, about the, the aspect of strategic disclosure. And um, so in this case, we looked at what do companies do with the, this possible technology. The predominant theory on handling this is called the prospect theory of patenting. And this was introduced in 77 by Kitsch, and what he suggested is that even if you don't understand the technology, even if you don't have a, far, a firm foundation in how to approach this, go ahead, patent it as broadly, as vaguely as you possibly can. So Kitsch was relying on the fact that patent examiners were blind. Um, he really fi figured that if you wrote it up, that the, the examiners would give it to you. So he, he wanted to angle for broad scope, and by that, use IP as a means for controlling future development. And uh, so he, and he figured that the primary value proposition for this very nascent technology would be in licensing. Well, of course, this 
theory had its fair share of critics. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed the fact that Mendel and Scotch, Scotchmer said that Kitsch was the earliest and perhaps most extreme licensing optimist. Um, and Scher noted that prospect theory is little influenced by any concern for reality. So what is the alternative? One alternative is strategic disclosure. And this is the non-patent use of disclosure for establishing prior art. Uh, this was uh, first brought up um, broadly as a strategic aspect by Parmachowski, and he, uh, he said it was an ideal uh, usage for patent races. Eisenberg challenged this, came up with some other notations about how, uh, how strategic disclosure, also known as defensive publication, um, and um, uh, defensive publication, uh, selective revealing or open revealing, uh, could be useful. Most of the literature on this method of uh, using strategic disclosure is based on the, the idealized two-party patent, two party patent race. And um, Henkel and Lernbecher pointed out that from their interviews with companies, this is not necessarily the case. The idea of using it in a direct one-to-one -one patent race is really not practical. But other than Henkel and Lernbecker, there really isn't any in, uh, use it, uh, evidence of how firms use strategic disclosure. So our research questions in this case is what ev evidence is there that firms use strategic disclosure? How do firms use strategic disclosure? And is there a value proposition for strategic disclosure? Now this comes out also from an article that we did uh, that showed up in California Management Review where we established a framework for different uses of strategic disclosure. You may reveal in order to, to establish a common ground for, um, for prior art, reveal in anticipation of patenting later, and that is in fact what we're talking about today. Uh, you can also patent and then reveal in order to inform and telegraph your, your uh, trajectory, or there's patent extend. In this case, what we want to do is look at uh, these nascent technologies or complex inventions that aren't fully understood, see how they eventually factor into patents that cite back to prior disclosure, and then see if there is a value proposition in that. And so in order to do this, uh, we went through uh, PATSTAT, we looked at the non-patent literature and established, um, we looked at corporate strategic disclosure journals, uh, most notable of which was is the IBM Technology Disclosure Bulletin. The reason we look at this is that, as far as we could tell, the only purpose for the company to publish in these journals was to, to disclose it as prior art. And so we, because other sources had ambiguous purpose, whether it was journal, uh, uh, scientific journal publications or, or market or trade publications, we felt that this strongly indicated the strategic intent. Um, we came up with a number of other companies, AT&T, Motorola, DEC, Intel, Xerox, TIRCA. We also identified a number of other firms that were non-US firms, uh, but because we were looking at the US patent set and because firms tend to uh, patent, pro uh, pro patent in their, their primary market, we excluded those. Um, then we identified all patents citing back to those uh, to that NPL literature, and we refer to these as recursive patents for uh, for any for a lack of a better term. And so, what we looked at was all the patents by those firms, and the and in the case of acquisitions, those firms that acquired them. Uh, so we were we were basically looking at patents, uh, specifically patents that IBM patents that cited back to the IBM Technology Disclosure Bulletin, and AT&T likewise citing back to AT&T. 
so we, we looked at this and we used a, a, effectively a two-stage regression model. Uh, in the first stage, we wanted to see if nascency or complexity correlated to the fact that, that this was a recursive patent. And in this case, we looked at it, um, we looked at it as a simple model and also with, uh, with controls for filing year and tech domain. And uh, we find that it is strongly correlated in all senses. So we found that if, if for the, the recursive patents tended to be either indicative of nascent technologies or highly complex technologies. Nascency is indicated by, by having a higher ratio of non-patent literature citations to patent literature citations, and complexity is a uh, number of claims. Then we plugged this output in and looked at it, looked at the output from the first one, showing that yes, these were, these were indicative of being nascent or complex, and then wanted to see if those had higher citations. And we looked at a 10-year citation count on this, and uh, in all cases, we found that indeed, the recursive patents being indicative of nascent or complex technologies were indeed likely to have higher citation counts. And so in this case, we find that the since previous literature focused on modeling of previous patent races, and we find that there's a demonstrative alternative for this, for an alternative patent proposition, value proposition. We um, are finding that there is an empirical qualification for when strategic disclosure is useful. And we are looking at the fact that, um, that this is robust for both five and 10 year uh, citation windows. So in some cases what we're seeing here, and, and the, the, the limitations for this of course are that we don't have evidence of what the initial motivation for the disclosure was. Uh, so we're, to some sense, extent, we're inferring the, the initial uh, the initial strategy here, um, but we do see that there is some value proposition to this, and this could be one possibility for why firms practice strategic disclosure and what value they get out of it. So, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. So you saved uh, seven minutes. <laughs> So um, we did too much well, and uh, in other words, we end up more than 30 minutes for discussion, so it's wonderful. So uh, we have uh, uh, four papers in this longer session and the uh, last session, so we will have a uh, Q&A time. But before people trying to remember what's the p uh, earlier presentation uh, using the, the, the chairmanship, let me toss two questions for the first, pa first paper and second paper. Regarding the first paper, you are investigating impact of the public funding moratorium on the licensing, but I wonder, before you try to investigate impact on the licensing, why don't you go on to first to impact, uh, look for impact on the research itself? Right? So that's uh, my, uh, my question. Regarding the second paper, uh, you found some different result from the result by uh, Nagaoka-san. So how would you explain these sorts of differences between your result and Nagaoka result? Okay, so let's open the question, then they'll respond. Okay. So they all forgot. <laughs> okay, Nagaoka san. Any any papers? Any papers?
measure might have taken in the United States because of the grace period. So it's really not a strategic disclosure in the sense that uh, uh, because in the, under the grace period, you lose nothing by disclosing uh, your publication early. And uh, so it's because uh, it does not constitute, uh, it will not constitute a prior ad for your patent application. So I think that the disclosure actually is, is no sacrifice. I mean, it, it, it does not compromise any patenting uh, possibility if it is done under the uh, term of grace period. So I wonder that uh, the so-called decassy patent is actually the patents which utilize grace period. So what drives might be the science literature rather than the technical patents. So my question is whether you have checked the, you, you, you mentioned that the number of uh, science literature was cited, but may, some of them might be the self-citations. So my question is, uh, the real driver was science literature, not the technical Britain. Tec my understanding is that technical Britain tends to uh, contain relatively low quality and uh, un unpatentable improvements, but uh, which may be just used, published, because uh, the, the firm would like to prevent others to, to patent those kind of uh, very easy uh, inventions. And uh, so what it seems to be that, so it seems to me that what, so my alternative understanding is that what derives the, 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 your result might be the science literature, which then is results in patenting, I mean cited by patent, but also it simultaneously uh, cites the, the, the technical data. Thank you. Hold the response. You can mic in you to Max. Let's ask Mark to raise the question. Then we'll ask the. My questions are for Maureen and Lisa. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So would you uh, answer to whatever raises question? Maybe from the first speaker? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think you're, what you're asking about is the, uh, if this falls within the grace period, um, and unfortunately, until we get better refinement of the non-patent literature, I can't use that as a as a variable in itself because the uh, because we don't have the publications indexed by by date. And in fact, I had to use a fair amount of of uh, fuzzy logic to to extract as many instances of it. However. Uh, I did compare, I, I did look through manually and, and so just do, did a partial comparison. And from what I saw, most of the, the, the lag time between the, the disclosures that I, that I checked manually and the patents that cited them were far outside of the, a one year grace period. So these were, what we were seeing were things that were five years uh, usually a five-year lag thereabouts. I'm sure there are probably some that that were within that grace period, but what we were seeing was evidence of of a much longer development cycle. Uh, no, actually, we 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 couldn't. We weren't looking at science literature. We were only looking at the the. Uh, the strategic journals, the defensive publication journals. So we, we couldn't look at that. Thank you. Let's turn to Shim Sa Yong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for your question. In terms of uh, looking at the impact of the changes in the, in the funding environment on scientific research, mm -hmm. uh, actually prior research has already looked at that and it's, um, the findings there are quite consistent with our work on IP commercialization. So what we see is an immediate drop, a significant immediate drop after these um, funding restrictions are put in place in the US, while in other countries um, um, the effect does not seem to be there. There doesn't seem to be a similar drop. And um, research does take up again once um, individual states start funding uh, this kind of research. So very uh, similar and consistent findings with our um, research on IP commercialization. In well, I thought that if research is dropped itself, then reduction in licensing is somewhat natural. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> true. So I think the more interesting aspect of our research is the impact on the uh, general environment in terms of su uh, support for the, um, the success of uh, IP, IP commercialization projects that are underway. So um, we find that um, even projects that um, 
if uh, companies they decide to uh, pursue projects in this area, the success rates they uh, significantly drop in areas where the scientific funding environment is, is poor. And I think that's where the main contribution of our research is. Thank you. Then Professor Chiang. Okay. <laughs> Uh, with regard to the question, why uh, our results uh, are different with those uh, funding in uh, Nagaoka 12 uh, 11. If my remember is uh, correct, I think maybe uh, the method to measure patent circuits may be different between our two papers. Uh, in the paper of Nagaoka, they use uh, a fragmentation of a patent stock ownership in in industrial sectors. Uh, in our case, we use uh, uh, different types of uh, index to measure patent circuits uh, between uh, firm pairs. So uh, maybe it's uh, some advice exists mm. in the sample selection or method selection, I think. Uh, mm. Actually, uh, I, I haven't uh, referred, uh, I haven't uh, indicated the the results for the uh, fragmentation actually used in our regulations. Our results is also different to, uh, with those uh, filed in Shackman uh, 2010. Uh, in in class uh, Shackman 2010, they report that uh, the fragmentations is uh, positively with the uh, distribute uh, in the United States. So, but uh, and so the they conclude that uh, uh, the fragmentation is associated, uh, positively associated with the uh, uh, license. However, in our case, uh, we get uh, negative uh, results. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, Mark, you can ask a question. Uh, <coughs> so, th thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, I, let me start with, I have a, a couple of comments. <coughs> So <laughs> let, let me start with the easier ones first. Um, uh, on on uh, uh, Tilo, Tilo is it or Tilo? Tilo, Tilo Peter's paper. Um, first, I like I like the idea that y you have a cleaner kind of view of of what it's more extreme, but it's cleaner for that uh, of what is strategically motivated. You know, to focus on the on this bulletin, the IBM bulletin. I think that's actually useful. Um, the, the, I think that you, you should look at the work by Sharon Bellinzone, who's the next student of mine. He teaches at, <coughs> at Duke University. And his co-authors, I forget, it's an Italian co-author, I forget, from Oxford. Um, they've done some nice work on, on strategic um, publishing, um, the defense of publishing. They don't have this IBM bulletin aspect. So it's the, inferring the motivations of the publishing is a little bit less clear. but. They focus, as I recall anyway, vaguely, on also the value implications. So I think you should have a look at their papers. Um, I, I don't think you have uh, identification, to be frank. I mean, you, you do it as two stages, but it's very unclear when you, when you regress rec recursivity against things like nascency and complexity. You're assuming that those, those two variables don't affect the forward citations in the second stage. And that, that I think, is very problematic. So, so I still see it not as identified, but as more correlational, but nonetheless interesting for that. Uh, I want to just turn now to F Florian's. So I want to, I think this is potentially quite interesting. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's there yet for, for reasons that I'll, uh, I'll, I'll mention, <laughs> frankly. Uh, first, you know, I'm, obviously I like the idea that you're looking at technological distance and product market distance, something which in the Bloom, Shankman, and Van Rien paper we pushed very hard. Uh, but what I think, uh, I think it would benefit, we should be very clear about the economics of this, which I, I didn't get from some of, your, some of your comments. The technological gains, I understand. I, 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 want, you know, I want to merge with somebody that I can learn from. And if they're so similar to me, I've got nothing to learn. And if they're so different from me, I don't know how to talk to them. So it's going to be some, somewhere in between. That makes sense. But the other side doesn't. The, the other side, which is the, the product market side that we thought very hard about, as you know, in that paper, uh, and others have before us, um, that the reason I want the product market side is essentially about internalizing pricing externalities. 
And, and that means I want to merge with people who, who, who have demands that are either complementary with me or substitutable with me. It's just that the prices will change in different directions in the two cases when we merge. But it's an internalizing pricing externalities or demand externalities. Um, that and or pure collusion on the product market side. Now, of course, that motivation is exactly the opposite of what the competition policy people should be thinking about. I want you to merge where there's technology gains and where there's no risk of these other things. So uh, now you're looking just at the private gains. That's fine. But, but um, this distinction didn't come out in, in, in your discussion. So for example, it is not at all clear to me, as you said, as I understood you to say, that if technology is, that there's a substitution between product market closeness and technology closeness. And I just think that's not correct on my understanding of the economics of the issue. So I think a rethinking of that might prove fruitful. Uh, the other thing I wanted to push you very hard on is to encourage you to think much more seriously than you have uh, empirically so far, apparently, on the product market measurement side. Um, because the use of SIC codes, industry codes, at the level you're using them are just way too crude. Firms, maybe not for small firms, but me even there, but for large firms, they're diversified across a wide set of these. That's what Bloom, Shankman, Van Rien is all about. And so, you know, maybe you can do better than we did in terms of measurement, but I think you need to do better than you have done in order to really, in order really to nail this point down. But if you could nail it down and distinguish uh, these motivations in mergers and acquisitions, I think that'd be a real, a real contribution. And finally, one small point, just on the measurement itself, um, of, of particularly of the technology side, um, you're building on Adam's work and, and, and subsequent work, but the one, motive, the one, one of the innovations in the bloom shankman Marine paper that you think you might want to look at um, and you can apply is the so-called Mahalabinus generalization, which basically, whereas Adam treated different industries, looked across the patenting profiles of companies and asked whether they were similar, he was treating different industries as essentially technology fields, I mean, as separate. But if I'm patenting in cottage cheese and you're patenting in yogurt, but we're not patenting in, in each, in both, you and I are actually quite close because those two fields are close. And we develop in our paper a way in which you can actually operationalize that, that cross-field similarity and that might give you more identification. Good, so uh, starting from the third presentation, uh, Florian, would you answer? Please? Thank you very much for the comments. They're very, very helpful. And also for me to take away, so I, I can't give you a definite answer on all of them. So um, just on the last point, um, the Malanobis distance, I, um, I looked at in the, in the first paper. So it's among the 10 measures I assess. Um, so I had a very close look at, at this bit. I actually developed a new measure which has the same concept. So you have your, um, essentially, it's the same as the um, angular separation with a mat uh, weighting matrix in between. So um, the weighting matrix determines um, how similar industries are, so determined by the co-citations uh, within a certain patent. So if in a patent certain IPCs are, occur very often, uh, they're supposed to be closer to each other, and I use that as a weighting matrix. Um, it's the similar approach as the Malanubis distance, but it's integrated into this measure slightly different. Um, and what this measure does, it's essentially bound between zero and one, whereas the Malanobis distance has a few properties which, which are a bit, uh, which are, are different. So the, the values are a bit dif more difficult to interpret and has a few, few other properties. Um, uh, but the, 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 the area, uh, so, uh, you know, having a weighting matrix in between, I think establishes a, a much higher degree of um, accuracy, especially if there are a few patterns in the portfolio. Okay, then Tilos. Well, I just wanted to thank you. I, I wasn't familiar with the uh, with the paper from Bell and Zone, uh, and uh, I think that will that will add to it. And yes, we're also we are working on firming up that uh, connection between that and the in the re regressions, and and that is a concern for us as well that we're still uh, trying to work out. But thank you. So, Professor okay. So, I also have two comments. <laughs> uh, one for, for Tilo, just a thought. It sort of vaguely addresses what Mark raised, although not directly. I, 
I'm a little worried. We, we know from a bunch of stuff that a lot of different people have done that patents that cite non-patent literature are sort of different from patents that don't. And I'm worried that you start off by choosing your so-called recursive patents by selecting on patents that cited some kind of non-patent literature. You give that a particular interpretation. Um, but just a thought, you could do, it's now fashionable to do these sort of placebo tests. You could do a test where you select a bunch of patents that cite, I, the thing that comes to my head is like IEEE transactions, you know, just some other non-patent source and treat them the same way you treated your, quote, recursive patents. If you find no effect, that would sort of reinforce your strategic interpretation of the um, uh, self-disclosure journals that you're, you're using. Whereas if you found that it looks just the same, that would sort of, I think, undermine the interpretation that, that you're giving to it. So that's just a thought for you. Um, I had a question for uh, Professor Zhang, which is motivated by Professor Stellner's paper. Because um, it seems to me that, in a sense, licensing is kind of like acquisition. I mean, in some sense, some of the things that would drive you to license would be related to some of the things that might drive you to acquire a firm. And in your blocking measures, all of your blocking measures have a piece of the formula, which is proximity. Uh, and I wonder whether you are finding these effects that are actually sort of proximity effects, but you're giving them a different interpretation because the proximity is buried in this more complicated formula. So again, just a suggestion of something to try. If you did your regressions, but just put in the proximity by itself, if you get sort of the same effects, then, then that would suggest that it's actually not about the thickets and blocking, whereas if you don't, that would strengthen your interpretation. Good, yeah. So, any response? Any response from the presenters? Zhang or what do you say? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for your very uh, good comments. Uh, actually, uh, uh, if, uh, <coughs> if you look at uh, the data source from the uh, uh, annual securities reports, we make it uh, maybe we can get uh, information for uh, group forms uh, uh, in that report. Uh, so we can maybe we will the future research for us maybe is to identify the member of uh, a group forms uh, uh, if they have a license between the group forms. So maybe uh, the effects of uh, uh, blocking are, are different uh, between the case to and and uh, not group of firms. So I think it's a very good idea we have to do next future, uh, future research. Thank you. And I just wanted to say I, I really like the idea of the, uh, of the placebo test, and I will integrate that. Thank you. So any other question or comment, feedback, intervention, or objections? <laughs> Over there? Okay. Can I ask in Japanese? Do you have a translation still? Okay. I have a question addressed to uh, Mr. Chan, Mr. Jan. Yes, so certainly uh, annual reports includes licensing information, but uh, it doesn't cover all licensing information of all companies, all businesses. So. Uh, how do you think that that, uh, uh, that factor uh, impacts on the result of your research? Uh, yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a good question. I think uh, actually there's a limitation in the uh, in that data source. You know, uh, the information released by the company they just want to show important contracts for this company to uh, stockholders. So. Uh, if the case uh, they think uh, the contracts is not important for their business, so maybe they uh, don't release it to the uh, hold, uh, uh, stockholders. So that's uh, maybe as a question for our sample. Uh, maybe there is other cases. Uh, there is other case. Uh, 
in which the company uh, has uh, some strategies uh, to uh, so they maybe uh, they want don't uh, they don't want to know, uh, let it know for stock holders so they don't release it for so to uh, stockholders. So this is a limitation for our data source. But as you know, uh, to get uh, information for uh, license is very, impo uh, very difficult in the empirical studies. It's uh, maybe it's a common problem, not just uh, faced by us, also by other research. So any uh, feedback uh, from... Uh, May I ask uh, you an additional question? Well, this is uh, not a question, uh, the request or the comment. In the Japanese annual reports, the, when it comes to the licensing information, the values, monetary values are released, or not in the annual report, I'd say. Well, let's say annual reporting. Annual re sometimes annual reports indicate the values of uh, the uh, licensing. Perhaps uh, you could uh, uh, define and collect such information in your future research, and that might produce an interesting result. I, I, I don't think uh, this kind of information including in this uh, data source, I think. And maybe you can, you can get information for the period of uh, contracts, but no the quantity of money. The company maybe does not release the, the money information for their contracts, I think. Maybe uh, <laughs> Professor Nagaoka, <laughs> you, <laughs> you answer better. <laughs> Please use the microphone. So the translation can. Uh, I think it's very difficult to analyze the value of the license and also the loyalty, right? Because uh, there's many firms do not disclose. But uh, but the additional comment for you is that uh, maybe you can differentiate unilateral licensing and cross licensing, because I think that uh, blocking or I mean patent ticket issue is more relevant to the cross licensing. And lots of cross license between, for example, Japanese electronics firms with IBM or Microsoft, and uh, those are really for the purpose of solving uh, patent tickets. But, for, but on the other hand, the Takeda pharmaceutical licensing new new pharmaceutical drug from the Roche, for example, it's really not for for it has nothing to do with the e patent ticket. It's really a uh, combination of new technology in the market. So differentiation between unilateral and uh, cross license may be next. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any last uh, intervention from Japanese audience or in Japanese language using this opportunity? Otherwise, people would have no objection of finishing the session in 10 minutes early <laughs> for reception. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let's join uh, uh, giving a big hand for all four presenters. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kunli and the panelists. Thank you very much.